It was very cool and interesting stuff. So we thought if, you know, we, I asked him if he could do the same thing for everyone here so everyone can get a chance to see what, what, what components are all about and how they're using it um, down in uh, Penn State. Um, so thanks again for doing this. Thanks for taking time out of your busy, busy day. I know you're pretty busy out down there, and so appreciate that. Um, so I'll, I'll give you the mic, and uh, I can um, stop talking now. <laughs> cool. Well, thanks for having me today. Um, I, my name is Brian Olendike. Uh, how many people are there, by the way? I'm just curious. Um, we have about 12 people. 12 million people. Wow. I mean, this is being recorded, so that's a, that's a big yeah. deal. 12 million. I've never had 12 million on a screencast before. That was a bad joke. But anyway, um, so as I mentioned, uh, my name is Brian Olodyke. I work at Penn State. Um, I work on a project called Elms Learning Network. Um, it's a next generation digital learning environment or NGDLE. Um, it's kind of, uh, it's like the, the world after the learning management system. Uh, so at Penn State, we do have a learning management system. We have Canvas, but then it's never going to meet the needs that we have, um, particularly in the College of Arts and Architecture where I work. So in that case, it means we either build or we buy stuff, and we've committed uh, pretty much 100% to, to building. Um, and so we've got a couple other units at Penn State that are also using Elm's Learning Network. Um, and so web components, which we'll be talking about today, is basically uh, – the technology decision we made as to how we can make it more cost effective, secure, and uh, ultimately cheaper. Uh, well, that's what cost effective is. So, um, <laughs> uh, to, to build this monstrosity that we're building um, as opposed to go and buy one. So I, because it's a very mixed audience as far as you said roles, I'm gonna run through uh, real quick just kind of this silly history of the web that I made for, for a previous presentation. So. Uh, Cause we're trying to, what we're trying to get at with web components is like, what is the point of this? What is, what is this technology? Why is this necessary? And why is it fundamentally different from everything else that's ever existed? Um, so I'm going to do a very brief history of the web. Um, can, can you see my, my screen before I make sure I'm talking to a thing? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So this is a, a very brief history of the web. Uh, so the web started, as we all know, in 1996 with Space Jam. And so uh, Space Jam, this is an actual website, uh, was the foundation of the web. You can go and find it still, um, MGM or whoever, Warner Brothers keeps this site around just for fun. Um, but this is back in the land of uh, table-based design. And so you would inspect, and you can actually go and inspect and see copyright 1996, bada bing, bada boom. They took things very seriously there. They also had an area for ads. Um, but everybody basically built things this way at that time. You built things with tables. Yay. All right. So the platform is a bunch of tables and we throw things into it. Move forward a little bit. Um, JavaScript really starts to take off. This is my own personal blog from forever ago. And the cool thing you could do with JavaScript is like ask someone a question and then you could inject that into the page and you could have like lightning bolts going and stuff. Very impressive stuff we know. Um, but this started to change the nature of the platform. It wasn't just about information presentation. It was semi-interactive, which led to kind of this wave of interactivity. And so we get uh, Macromedia Flash because we need something more interactive than the platform. The web is kind of a crappy platform for interactivity. And so we get wonderful things like Zombocom at that point. If, if no one's familiar with Zombocom. So I got a lot of old internet references here. So then we move from just a silly thing to like Homestar Runner. If, if you've ever gone to Homestar Runner, the entire platform is flash based. And then we see things start to kind of arc back, uh, back towards JavaScript. So the web keeps advancing. People don't want these proprietary types of formats like flash. Um, and the original Facebook, you know, comes out and looks horrible, but it is built on HTML JavaScript. And people go, wow, you could actually build stuff on these things. Um, then we get into slightly more complex frameworks. So you get a uh, prototype, for example, uh, an early precursor type of a framework. And then you start to see the early stages of a platform built on prototypes. You have Twitter in this case, which looks just as bad as it does now. Um, then move forward and go, okay, well, we need to get a little bit more engaging, interactive. And so there's kind of this uh, video tag manifesto, which is called by Opera. 
and Opera um, was pushing, hey, wouldn't it be great if we could just natively do video on the web? Then we wouldn't need Flash anymore. Move forward a little bit more, we start to get into things like jQuery. We start building far more sophisticated interactions just right in the browser uh, with less and less time to develop. This is actually a, a call out to our own project. This is an interface I made 11 years ago at this point as part of Elms. Uh, then the, in 2008, HTML5 draft is proposed. Um, and it took a very long time to ratify this, but it's kind of it's culmination of all these things. Hey, the, the web is actually more of a platform now. It's not just a bunch of tables we throw together, it's not just widgety interactions. You can actually build legit things with this. And so um, people get a cookie if they know what this is from, but so this is the original, I'd say, use the platform hashtag. This is uh, WebOS uh, by HP. It failed miserably. You can still find it on some televisions, but you wrote apps in JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. Um, and it was a, way ahead of its time. Now, unfortunately, way ahead of its time by today's technology standards is 2009. Uh, so 2010, Jobs says, we're not doing Flash, and basically starts the, the death spiral of Flash. Um, Google starts to kick off in 2010, Angular JS, very popular uh, development uh, application development framework you know, on the web. Then in 2011, we see the first uh, presentation about something called web components. And so you've got all these people building these different ways, trying to increase interactivity, reduce complexity simultaneously um, for absolutely no other reason other than just context and a shout out to myself. Um, five, you know, this is now eight, six years ago, my God. Uh, I started work on what is now called Elms Learning Network. Uh, 2013, uh, Facebook starts to work on React and says, yeah, the web can be a platform. This is how we're going to build against it. In 2013, Ionic uh, says HTML can replace mobile native app development. And so why are we building things um, in Swift and C Sharp and Java? Why, why can't we just build in the web? Because we're going to have to deploy to the web anyway and then run it and make it show up on phones. Uh, Electron, something very similar. Electron says, well, can't you just make desktop apps out of this? And right around that time, 2013, Google starts a library called Polymer, and people don't know what the heck it is, to be perfectly honest. Uh, 2014, HTML5 is ratified, <laughs> it took, which took six years. Um, so as far as innovation, right, to get a spec, you know, a standard that effectively says this is what a video tag is, to take six years is kind of absurd. Um, 2015, Homestar Runner is very sad. Flash is effectively dead. Uh, 2015 as well, though, we see Polymer goes to 1.0. Uh, and then 2016, we see Polymer goes to 2.0. And 2017, uh, which now, you know, it's about a year ago, um, my team said, we are abandoning all other development practices and we are using this full on. Um, so what is it? Like, what is the platform? Throughout all of this, right, we start with kind of the platform is just HTML, and then, oh, we need it interactive, it goes to Flash, it kind of goes through a metamorphosis and comes back around to effectively HTML. And it's people trying to figure out, like, how do we make the web actually be able to be a full on development platform? And so, Polymer, so hinted at, as so I put it in there three times, is uh, kind of this thing people don't really get what it is, but it powers this. Uh, so this is the new version of Google Earth. This is running in the browser, and by new I mean at this point it's like a year, year and a half old. Um, but it is built on web components. And so Google has kind of gone through this iteration. Google has said, hey, web components are the thing we're gonna use to build on. Now they've also said, hey, we're gonna build on Angular. And so they've kind of got these semi-competing visions, although I'll explain it's not competing. Um, but another example where you can see this is on YouTube. If you go to youtube.com, it, it switched over uh, about eight months ago, I think, uh, to using Polymer and web components. So what does that actually mean? I haven't explained web components. So if you would view source on the new youtube.com, you're gonna see all these tags. And while in our very first example, at the beginning of the history of the web was Space Jam, we had tables and TRs and TDs, and that was awful. Uh, now, we have things that don't even look like HTML. <laughs> and so, this isn't traditional HTML. Um, what you're looking at is a custom element. And custom element is a piece of the web component specification. So what, basically what you're doing is you're encapsulating 
um, all that functionality into a brand new HTML tag. And so the, the web component specification is all around how do we make that possible? Because if I can build in this way as a developer, uh, as someone that cares about accessibility or cares about usability, I can now place that tag somewhere and know exactly what it's going to do. I don't need to scope CSS, I don't need to scope JavaScript, as long as I can make that tag appear and be the YouTube browser bar, it's always gonna be YouTube browser bar, no matter where I use it. And so what we kind of saw through the ages is that we got, right now we're in about Polymer 2, 3, which Polymer is just a way to manufacture web components, it's by Google. Um, but so effectively the platform that has won out is just, it, it's a mutation of these three things. It's that we, you know, we need to display elements, we need them to be slightly interactive, and we need a way of styling and presenting them. And so what we end up getting is uh, this, this is web components. If you go to webcomponents.org, you can not only search through a registry of them, but you can learn more about just the specification, what the heck it is, why uh, we've basically abandoned all efforts to do anything else, and we'll never do anything again, other than web components, <laughs> which I don't say lightly. Um, but effectively, it's a four-part specification of the browser that was agreed upon during the, uh, the HTML5 project, or um, uh, debate, so to speak. And so while they were going through and saying, okay, we, gotta, we want to make the specification for HTML5, and we saw the video tag just took you know, three years to get accepted, right? Do we really wanna go through this process for every new tag? Um, this approach is awesome to building the web, but it's taken a really long time to approve these. So they started to push these kind of, these four specifications. Funny you say four, there's actually five things listed here. But I'll go through, go through these in a second. I'm gonna jump forward in my slides a bit. But effectively, here we go. Um, what, we, what we end up getting, and you can search for this on webcomponents.org when we apply those four parts of the spec, is you can make your own elements that you can share with other people that will effectively work anywhere. And so as a silly example, because I like silly examples, I have awesome explosion. And so uh, an awesome explosion, if we can imagine, would look like this. It would be, all right, I want an awesome explosion to show up on the web, so I'm gonna write awesome hyphen explosion, and I get an awesome explosion. And then, well, what if I want to change the size of it? Well, I could add properties to it, and I could say, all right, well, size equals tiny, small, big, or epic. And so we're kind of able to treat the web as an API. Um, so as developers, it makes developing a lot easier, but also it helps people downstream too, right? Or from a training perspective, for example, um, if you just went to someone that isn't a developer and you said, hey, I need you to put an awesome explosion on the web, they'd be like, huh? But, and you'd say, okay, well, no, it's easy. You just type a uh, bracket, IMG space SRC equals uh, quote, go to a random place where there is an awesome explosion dot GIF uh, you're gonna paste it in there and you're gonna leave appropriate alt metadata um, so it's accessible, all that stuff, right? Every, every human being on earth knows how to do that. No. So what we can do that is we can say, okay, well, instead of me needing to teach someone all this advanced CSS, can I teach you how to just basically copy and paste mutations of this? Cool, so awesome explosion in red or blue could be just setting a color value. And then combining the two, we can have a big, awesome red explosion, uh, literally by copying and pasting this tag. And it's not just a silly example, it actually does work. You can go and copy and paste this tag if you really want an awesome explosion on your website, although obviously that's not the, the point of the specification. So looking at the guts of that, like what is this? Why is this so different? Um, let's look at the, the four parts of the spec, although it's, it's fun, it's, I say four and then anyone could easily raise their hand and count and go, there's five items there. Um, but it's actually four, these last two are the same thing. It's more or less just the way you get material there. Um, but so this is what a web component looks like. Uh, you have a file that is effectively defining, this is, hey browser, when you see this, I mean this, more or less. And so stepping through, pointing to the different parts of it. At the top of one of these files, we have an import reference. Now. Um, this is where there's the, the two ways of getting things in. This is uh, called an HTML import. And so an HTML import, you effectively reference another file, and then the browser will go, oh, I know what you mean, and it'll track everything around and put all the dependencies together more or less. 
Uh, script type modules is another way of doing this. It's the way that's going to win out. Uh, but we're kind of in this interim phase where there's two ways of including and referencing stuff. Just know it's, it's not that big a deal. It's more about uh, long-term build routines, really in the weeds type of stuff. So you need to be able to reference something and import it to get it in there is the, the key thing. Then you need a concept of a template tag. And so if a browser supports a template tag, that basically says that when this is uh, stamped onto the page, right, when you write awesome hyphen explosion, that it's not gonna just unpack the DOM and put that there. It's gonna hold this in, in kind of a holding pen um, under the hood. And then whenever it's told to actually go in and template, templatize, template stamp, whatever you wanna call it, uh, it into the DOM, it's then gonna say, okay, everything between there, put that into the interface. Then you have a uh, custom element shadow DOM. So because this is a custom element, right, I can write awesome hyphen explosion and it's gonna know what that is. Uh, but the shadow DOM concept is that I can effectively style that in a vacuum. So if you're familiar with uh, concepts of containerization from a security perspective with like servers and that we have lots and lots of servers and we virtualize and contain them, uh, think about that, but for style and design. So how many people uh, have been running SaaS and, and less and all kinds of different um, build, build compilations and, and you know, using heuristics like BEM so that you can namespace and prefix all of your um, style selectors appropriately, just so you can get like a block on one page to be the right size at the right time. So imagine if you didn't have to do that anymore. Um, the element that as it gets brought in is gonna have all these styles uh, constrained directly to it. And so I know that if I put down an awesome explosion and I say size equals small, it will always be that size. Um, the only time there are exceptions is when I want there to be exceptions as a developer. So as a result, you don't have to worry about a scoping context in which you dump some code in uh, like you would with a bootstrap or a materialized CSS or uh, Zurb Foundation. Uh, we've actually backed out of all three of those frameworks over the years. So <laughs> um, this, this approach also replaces those the technologies. And so then we start to get into, okay, well, uh, this is just HTML. It's a way of presenting HTML. You can throw HTML into it, much like any other HTML tag. So you can put tags and tags and nest them, uh, just like you could any normal HTML tag. Uh, so in this case, you know, this is that API abstraction, if you will. I have an IMG SRC equals. Um, and then this, is, this starts to get into Polymer-specific syntax, but it's effectively uh, data binding. So it's saying, you know, in that higher level tag, when I say awesome hyphen explosion uh, image equals whatever, you know, like explosion.gif, that's gonna effectively take that value and print it here uh, when the page renders. From there, we can, we can define additional properties like that something is playing or we can call different event listening. You know, you can write JavaScript, right? It's, it's a JavaScript element or based element, so to speak. Um, then I can you know, just attach different functions to it if I want to. And so using those, um, we can effectively make something that kind of just runs everywhere. Um, so it doesn't matter what our deploy you know, target is, it doesn't matter if it's a static website, it doesn't matter if it's a content management system, we can write once and reuse anywhere. Um, so right now we're writing elements um, under the banner of um, LRN Web Components is the, the, the group on on GitHub that we commit to. We have, I believe, 139 different elements at this point. And we, when we write one of them, it's, I know it's gonna work in our grab CMS sites, in our static generator sites, in our Electron apps we're working on, in Elm's Learning Network, in our Drupal sites. Those considerations of system-specific theming go completely out the window. Um, so we write once and publish many. So it's effectively decimated the amount of time it takes to, to make anything or to go after new, new targets, so to speak. Um, so a year ago, if you said, hey, Brian, uh, you're gonna be making some desktop apps, I would have laughed at you or said, yeah, and you're gonna hire me a whole ton of people. But now, uh, because of custom elements, we can kind of you know, build out whole interfaces and experiences in, and they're just for the web. They're no longer specific to a solution. So. This is a, a screen grab of uh, something, a prototype from Elm's Learning Network. Literally every aspect of this is a custom element. 
but it's also a custom element that would work literally anywhere else. So unlike all past ways in which you would do development, right? I would be writing super specific CSS to get these things on there, to get these icons on there, to get buttons placed the right way. Now, because I'm just scoping everything, I can keep building up from very small pieces and all of my larger pieces are still scoped. So before I move on to actually showing, showing anything that we've made with this, um, does anyone have any questions about that? Like it's kind of a, it's just like a, the internet as you knew it is a lie type of concept. So if anyone has any questions, uh, please let me know. Any questions? Uh, browser support, everything so far? So browser support is uh, polyfilled in uh, parts of Firefox and Edge. Um, if you use the script type modules method of integration, it works natively in, in Safari. Um, it doesn't go bad, like the hard stop is um, IE9. Technically, you can get this to work in IE10, but really we shouldn't be supporting that stuff anymore. Um, IE11 is finicky, but can be made to work. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it works across the board. It's whether or not there's gonna be a polyfill in place. Um, the nice thing though is that uh, over the last year, this grid of check, bar, check marks next to stable has kept increasing. It used to only be Chrome and Opera that had full coverage. Um, and now it's pretty close to, you know, you see um, really there's very little left that needs to be polyfilled. On those platforms then, what, what you're talking about with a polyfill is, it's gonna take a little bit longer to render. Um, you may get some stylistic differences uh, between the platforms, but from our experience over the last year, they've been minimal. Um, so yeah, anything, anything modern, um, and by modern, I mean last three years with the exception of Edge, although I mean Edge has been out for a while now, so. Anything else before we move on? Yeah, that doesn't look like that. Okay. So, um, yeah, that's a, it's a really important question. Um, so you can look at what the polyfills are, what they do on webcomponents.org. Webcomponents.org is a just a community site for sharing uh, these assets. Google did put it together. Um, because it does get a little confusing at times, um, even in ex expressing it like there's web components, which is a standard, and then there's Polymer. Polymer just happens to be a very popular way to make web components. You don't have to use Polymer. In fact, um, BYU just makes what are called like vanilla elements, right? So they just write directly to the specification. Um, if you write directly to the specification, that helps with going backwards and browser support a bit more. Um, but it's, it's one of those, uh, you know, if you think of Polymer almost as like a, a very lightweight version of jQuery, right? A lot of people still are going to end up writing a lot of the same functions to get stuff to work. So um, we've, we've pegged to Polymer at the moment, but what we really care about is the web component specification itself. Um, so the way that we, we end up developing things now, um, the other reason we use Polymer is because it has really good tooling. But so I'll, uh, I'll make an element so you can see. Um, so I'm gonna make a directory, and that directory um, we'll call Utah Rocks, sure. All right, go into Utah Rocks, and I'm gonna type Polymer init, and I'm gonna start on an element. It's basically just gonna go and get some, some code and put it in place for me. Um, to look at what a Utah Rocks element looks like. We see we have a utah-rocks.html file, um, and then we've got uh, some Bower, Bower components, it's basically just dependency management, so it went and got all of these different pieces uh, for me to use. Then if I look in a utah-rocks file, let me 
make it pop up here. Um, I can do Polymer serve open, which will start a little mini server. Um, and so this is how we do all of our development with web components is we start off a new element and you see we get this little boilerplate that says, you know, Utah rocks in this case. And so where we go from there is, if I open said Utah rocks element, um, you see this one looks a little bit different than the one I showed before because it uses a newer syntax. But um, if I want to add a property, uh, like so if it was title or something, then I can do a default title of Utah rocks. And then in the, in the template, like in the, you know, the HTML that I'm writing, I can now use title. And so what I'm doing here is effectively uh, setting up data binding so that whenever the property changes, which I can then inspect HTML and see, it will just go and do it. So let's look at, there's Utah rocks. Okay, so Utah rocks now. I can do title equals a lot, and you'll see you'll get it reflected in real time. And so using this little data binding concept and building out you know, the different properties that you wanna use, you can kind of build anything. Um, and so you start very small always. Um, you know, so the first thing I'll probably do is I go to webcomponents.org and be like, I want a button or I want a card. And so I can find a paper card in this example. And we can look at it and we can get a demo and see, hey, do you want a card that looks like this? Now, how many developers over the years have built a card element or some design facet that is a card? Um, and then you go through and write a whole bunch of CSS or you go and look for a thing. So what I can do to get this card into my build, I can click this little plus sign and it gives me the Bower install command for it. And then I will go to my folder where I have this Utah rocks file and paste. And that goes and gets all the dependencies for that card so that I can use it. Um, now, if I want to use that card, we have to reference it so that it can show up basically. And so I can do a paper hyphen card, paper hyphen card dot HTML. And so now the, the command went and, so the first command went and got all the dependencies, put them in place. This second part tells our Utah rocks element, hey, I need you to use paper card or else I'm not gonna work. And now we can go and look at their demo that they have. And I can see the way that a paper card is supposed to work. And we'll copy and paste this and won't, won't work flawlessly, which is part of the point. But so I can copy and paste in paper card, right? So I can start to stack elements into elements more or less, right? So I've now, it is the Utah rocks element, but now I've put in paper card. And so I'll get this exact thing here minus the donuts most likely. Um, but in their little example, they have reference to iron icons. So I can, I can kind of, I can go and do the same thing. They have paper button, paper icon button. And so I can, because I know where these are, at the moment, like I could go to webcomponents.org and find iron icons or find paper button, but I'm just gonna cheat real quick. Paper button, paper icon button, or uh, what is this? Yeah, paper icon button. And so I can effectively get all the dependencies, the, the visual asset dependencies for those things. And now so long as I reference them on the page, they'll just work. And so I can do paper icon button and paste that, copy, paste, and do paper button. And what was the other one? It was iron icon. Okay, so although iron icon would probably come in via that, but we'll just do it anyway. Iron icon, iron icon. And this is the general convention around web components is to keep you know, single elements nested inside a single folder that has the same name. You don't have to do that, but it certainly helps long-term. So looking back at Utah Rocks now, when I hit refresh, you see we get the card that's raised up. It has the cafe basilico. It has my broken image, so I would need to reference a, a real image instead of this donuts one. Let me find a real image. I'm sure I have one somewhere. 
There we go. All right. So there's a, a picture of me now in this little card. And then these buttons that were on the times. So the 530 example, there it is. Paper button, 530 PM. That's now used this button. And so I get this nice little tap ripple. And so um, apparently I don't have the icon. Oh, I know what I know what the issue with the icon is. <laughs> I need to download. There's iron icon and there's iron icons, um, which is annoying that it's a, it's different, but that should get it. Oh. Apparently not, but I'm not going to waste time on icons. So um, that's kind of the the general workflow with building these things, right? Is that I can build a little tiny element, and then I can go up one level, and then I can build a slightly more complex element referencing everything else that I just put in there. And so we've been doing this uh, for the better part of a year now. If you search for LRN on webcomponents.org, um, we have 57 elements that are listed on webcomponents.org. Our, our Git repo behind the scenes, we have way more because I just haven't, we haven't gotten around to publishing them all there. Um, we have a pretty decent sized community of contributors from Penn State at this point um, that have been influencing the elements or just outright building them. And we're starting to do increasingly more complex things. So you start small and then you keep widowing your way up. So uh, another one is uh, MathJax. So another nice thing, this comes automatically with Polymer. Whenever you start making Polymer-based elements, you get these nice little mini documentation sites. So it's not like we maintain these. Uh, we just write code. And so this is an element, this LRN math tag, um, that if you put it on any web page and the web page knows what LRN math is, then it's going to render math. And that probably, I hope, seems trivial. Maybe someone in the room knows how not trivial that is. Because um, our, our, uh, the people that, that made this as part of our science, science college were freaking out um, when they did this because it, we used, uh, Elms is, has a lot of Drupal uh, to it. And so just getting Drupal integration for something like a, a front end asset like this seemed kind of silly. It always has felt weird, um, but that's the way everybody did it. So it must be right. And so now he, within like two days of making this tag, he wiped out all module dependencies on MathJax, wiped out all of our front end dependencies on, on MathJax. Um, and instead now they're delivered via this. So uh, that's, you know, we, we just keep taking examples. Um, it doesn't, it starts to not really matter what it is. You know, we've done things like MathJax will do something as, as simple as like an avatar, right? So uh, in this case, this is just a user picture um, or a mathematically generated symbol based on a name that's passed in. Um, that then starts, you know, again, that's, Trivial, right? You see that on Yammer, you see it everywhere else. Uh, Outlook uses a ton of them. But then when we start to boil that up into our own systems and usage of these things, right? That little, that little avatar there in the, case, in the case of Elm's Learning Network and this avatar, um, once we make that element work, we effectively get that functionality for free. And so, um, yeah, we did have to make that element initially. But now that we have it, anytime I want an avatar, I just go, oh, I'm just gonna write this tag and implement it. And so that little admin tag right there, we can see LRN design avatar, label admin. If I change label to uh, Steve, now it's selected a color and, and the, the label dynamically. If I say, uh, I think it's J Denticon. No, thought it was J Denticon. It's like J identicon or J identicon, something like that. But if I if I add that option in, oh, there it is, J identicon. But if it, if that option's added in, now it's going to take that label and it's going to turn it into a mathematically generated piece of art. So these like all these things are really complex on their own. But now every system I ever make, I can just include the reference to LRN Design Avatar. And I know how it works now. I can read the documentation. Um, this, is, this process has seen us go from um, hiring junior developers who would basically have to sit there for four months and 
figure out our systems, figure out Drupal, uh, figure out Drupal's theming layer um, or whatever content management system we used. And now we have people contributing within days um, of, of just getting in front of this approach. The other awesome thing from a, just a process standpoint has been um, just knowing that everybody's building things in a similar fashion. So for example, this math element, I didn't make this math element. I did put some work into it yesterday, but it, I was able to read through it yesterday while we were having a meeting and understand every aspect of what um, my teammate, Michael Potter had been doing. And so I could, I already knew the general way at which this was built. So I could go in and go, oh, okay, yeah, let's, let's make this work with some of the other approaches we've been working on. So we've been kind of progressively uh, collapsing into this approach over the last year. Um, and I'd say within the last month, we've gone from progressively collapsing to um, just kind of blowing the minds of everyone, even like on our team that we work with, uh, because it seems like we're rolling out increasingly more complex functionality. Uh, and sometimes it takes minutes or, or hours to build. Um, and I'm not, I'm not kidding. So for example, a year ago when we started down this path, we went, okay, let's make sure this is okay. Let's make sure cross browser um, accessibility. Let's make sure all that's fine. And so we just took like a button. I literally took this button on the interface and the interface didn't look anything like this at that time. And I said, all right, I'm just going to make that a, a paper button and I'm going to go down the hall and then I'm going to have everybody tap on it and say, Hey, do you like this ripple effect? And everybody went did without saying what browser to use. They just went and they, Oh, that's nice. That's neat. I was like, that's amazing. Okay. It actually works. It actually does the thing that it claims. And so then we, kind of just kept going up and up and up from there. Say, okay, well, let's take, now let's not just do a button, let's do a fly out. All right, let's not just do a, a button and a fly out. Let's, okay, let's make a fly out exactly the way we want it. Let's make a modal, let's make collapsed field sets. Let's make our own icon sets. Let's make our own, uh, right? And so we either are borrowing other elements that already exist or we're making our own. And each time we're then, solving that problem kind of forever. And so, for example, when I keyboard tab through here and I tab over to the settings menu and I expand it, and my focus is placed inside of that element that's actually trapped in it until I hit close, and then it, the browser is refocused on this area. This is, these are not trivial things um, to be able to, to pop this stuff up, close it and have the correct state maintained, close that, have the correct state maintained except now for us, it is trivial. So that's a single tag uh, called LRN, it's LRN sys drawer, and the modals are LRN sys dialog. And so now with a single tag, if we look at um, what, those, what those look like, a, an LRN sys drawer, in the case of a drawer, it's again, it's just stacking more and more of these elements together. And so, I import some buttons, I import layout tools, I import tool tips, I import other things that I've already made. And so now what we end up getting when it's implemented is um, we have a button, go back to LRN sys layout, open that up so we can see the examples. Um, we get a button that if, so this is the way that this is implemented, is you effectively just write LRN sys drawer text, which equals that, icon, which in this case equals this, uh, alt info, which is the hover state, and then some other properties as far as which direction it should come from, what color it should be. Now I hover over it, I click, and I get the menu from the right side with whatever contents are in it. So now I'm not worrying about accessibility. I'm not worrying about um, you know, stack order context, for example. Um, that tag takes care of both of those concerns. That's not to say they were trivial to make <laughs> by any means. Um, but now it's like once I've solved those accessibility and those design challenges, now when I want to use it again, I just put it back on the page. And then when I want it to jump out from the left instead of from the right, I'm working in this little container where I can just focus on that aspect. Um, this also, we haven't done it for this purpose yet, but this starts to have really big implications for. Um, interfacing with like third-party systems, right? So 
right now, I mean, because you guys are education, I'm education, we buy systems and then they say, yeah, you can add in, you know, this JavaScript file or whatever for your tweaks um, and give you kind of a little bit of ability to influence stuff, but very, not very much. Um, this allows you to kind of protect your changes from them. And so if I want to inject a like Penn State button, for example, traditionally I would do like div and, and maybe some vector type of stuff with SVG. Um, but so I would, I would add that into the interface on a third party system and then they change some CSS classes or then they change the, the font relative, you know, font point relative type of stuff. And now my logo is busted because they made a change versus if we're doing this and instead, like let's say I wanted that Penn State branding on something, I can now inject a PSU hyphen logo. All the CSS and everything is heavily scoped to that element. And now in my little you know, JavaScript or whatever I would include in a third party vendor thing, I could just inject the reference to what a PSU logo is. And then I could place a PSU logo on the DOM and it would unpack and go, oh, you mean that stuff, nice. And I would have it. Um, so this gives a lot, a lot of accountability to you know, where something came from, how it got there, how it should look, all of those things. Um, so we've been building, you know, full on applications with this now. Um, and so this is our, this is our content system. I'll actually go to some real content, um, log in here real quick. And so logging in. We have Duo, okay, so I'll log in. It's gonna take me to course content we have. So this is actually course content we have out to, to, to learners. And so they get, you know, this is Elms Learning Network's interface. They get consistency and buttons um, and accessibility, tab order, all that stuff. But then as we keep, right, we just keep stacking those concepts together, um, we can build full applications and say, but these are design assets, how is that possible? And I, that was actually what I said to start. Um, but if I go to webcomponents.org and I search for something called Iron Ajax, um, this basically changed my entire development worldview. <laughs> so Iron Ajax um, takes this concept we just talked about with web components and that you can make your own properties and says, but I mean, it doesn't have to be visual, right? Everything we've done is visual, but it, it doesn't have to be anymore. I could just put a tag on that has some other meaning and basically abuse these systems that I have in place. And so to see what that is, um, this is a, an Iron Ajax tag, an Iron Ajax tag talking to an endpoint. And then the endpoint says, hey, I need you to just take whatever you find and you're gonna just put cards on this interface. So I've got cards there that came from a data source, but what, is that, what does that look like? So to look for what that code looks like then, is I can see here's here's a, an example usage of an Iron Ajax tag, and so you can say Iron Ajax uh, URL to connect to parameters to pass in handle it as JSON, and then on the last item you get, I need you to do two way data binding to this thing says Ajax response. Then I can say okay, well do a template statement, which was that template tag, right? That kind of puts things in a holding pen. Well, there's these, these other templates, they're called like template factory things in Polymer. One is an if statement to just a simple Boolean and the other is a repeater. And so I can go template is DOM repeat items and then bind it to the items that just came across from that data feed. And so now this is effectively a for loop that's gonna run through and it's gonna stamp down these things, no matter what comes across. So using that concept in our encapsulated design stuff, we can then go and build a full on application. And so this is making Ajax calls to a Drupal site. It's loading the content uh, on the other side and then spitting it down into the DOM on this side. And so whether this is just static HTML or what, uh, we're, we're, you know, this is the fastest Drupal site. Uh, on earth, at least as far as from this perspective, <laughs> to a lot of people. Um, so this is a Drupal site and it's reading off just traditional Drupal data structures, but then it's taking those and going, oh, 
instead of me presenting node 35 and doing a full bootstrap, I'm gonna send an Ajax, Iron Ajax call, render that content, and then put it back in the app. And so that gives us this very fast, very quick user experience using other tags and maybe we go, oh, well, we need a modal. So then that uses the LR and Sys dialog, capturing that thing and going, oh, you clicked on node 45, let's send that across. Um, we can you know, build a full application out of this. Um, we can also standardize a lot of our UI elements, right? So instead of needing to worry about the way a, a print menu works, I can just use a print icon that's from a standard icon library. I can then point to a menu type of behavior, and now I have these options presented. Um, so whether they're completely headless or whether it's we actually have Drupal's templating engine spitting out some components, um, we, get, we can use the same elements on either side. So we've, we've used this to build content systems, um, used it to build uh, studio, which I can't show you real student studio data, but this is uh, an online art studio. And so using these approaches, I have like a Kanban board where I can manage my project. I know what step I'm on. I can see, hey, I have started this. And then I can click to start it. These are then little Polymer apps running, even down to you know, this type of stuff. We do two-way data binding for the input. This is an element. Everything starts to become an element effectively, and not just an element, an element that we can reuse at any other time. So now this drag and drop upload field that just did that there, that's called a Vadden upload field. I didn't make that, but it's a really awesome webcomponents.org uh, uploader. Okay, publish. Yep, publish the studio, and now other people would be able to have a conversation around my artwork. The same dialogues that drove my interface interactions now can drive this modal thing. The buttons, I don't have to worry about the buttons. Uh, there's actually a, it's a sea dragon zoom, zoom type of a thing. And so I can start doing data binding with that library. Um, if I wanna have a discussion here, I can add comments. Well, the buttons function the same way as all the other buttons do. Um, the, you know, I have a little pop-up that says, hey, you did a great job, or be nice to each other, or save. All that stuff starts to come for free. We kind of have this toolbox of, of things that we can draw from uh, to build new things. And so uh, we're seeing a massive increase in, uh, in student, student presence, student instructor presence, uh, conversations people are having back and forth, just because the UX patterns are easier to use are a lot faster and more consistent. Um, we're able to build things in weeks instead of uh, months uh, and guarantee that they're more accessible than what we would have done previously because we're just stacking those other elements on top of one another. Um, from a long-term accountability standpoint, if we find, oh shoot, there is an accessibility flaw in you know, my, uh, my tap modal or whatever that thing is, we've got it automatically isolated to a single tag. So for example, there was an accessibility issue with these flyouts. I didn't have to go around and go, oh crap, uh, where did I use all those flyouts? I could fix it in one place and then push out that one file. And now everything that references that file has the more accessible uh, dialogue that, that does the drawer flyout. Um, so this is really kind of obliterated our, our development process really blown up what we used to go after, what was possible. Um, so all the while that we've been doing this, a project we've had on the back burner for ages now, like three years, is, um, is this project we codenamed Hacks. And Hacks was short for Headless Authoring Experience. Um, and we said, well, if we've got all these tags and we can build things in you know, literally days and weeks that used to take months, this is actually gonna be in, in scope, we could do this. And so what the idea with Hacks was is that all authoring on the web is tied needlessly to platforms. There is an authoring pattern that is better. It is the perfect authoring pattern for anyone. We just happen to always be tying it to solutions because that's what we've always had to do. So you can, you know, if you don't believe me, you can go and use wix.com and not that I, love Wix.com, but a lot of people are able to use and leverage Wix.com because it has a really easy uh, development paradigm, right? Same with Squarespace, 
Same with any of that website tonight software. It's empowering people that don't understand the web to do the thing they meant to do, generally speaking. So those systems cost a lot of money to use and are closed source. So why can't, why can't we build those? So our team has been going after this thing called Hacks, as I mentioned. If you go to uh, H-A-X-T-H-E-W-E-B.org, uh, which is hackstheweb.org, you can see it running uh, live. And so this is a, a fully decoupled authoring solution that is built on web components. And so you know, we can start to see similar types of paradigms where I have buttons, icons, colors, UI, patterns, opening and closing dialogues, stack order, all of these things start to come for free, buttons, check boxes. If that stuff is just there and I can draw from the library that I've always been building, we can start to build some pretty ridiculous stuff. So the other things were kind of cool. Um, this is a web component based authoring system uh, that knows how to actually uh, interface with other web components and write them. So I want to edit text. I should be able to just reach out and, and edit text. I should be able to double click on something and make it bold or double click on something and make it italicized. And that's nothing that's cool. Uh, I never dreamed I would be making a WYSIWYG. And that's really neat to go, oh, cool, I made a WYSIWYG and I can highlight this and I can implement little buttons here that move it up and down and that's, that's great. Um, but I go, I need to add something and then all UX patterns for every content management system on earth break down. It just becomes a wash of, you know, uh, click through 10 forms, maybe get a token from some place, maybe submit these four things and then, you know, we'll stitch together via blocks or whatever the construct of that CMS is. I should just be able to put something there. So this is where rich media comes in. Rich media at the moment, I'm still working on this, but has kind of these three paradigms of, I want to add something to the page. I want to find something and put it there, or I want to make something. So let's say that I had a YouTube link already that I went to a YouTube video and, and of course, self uh, propaganda. This is apparently some video that I made. So I have that link and I want to embed it. That is a, we'll say anywhere from 30 second to 20 minute operation for your average user. Why? Because when I went to YouTube and I'm, I'm the average user, I go, I want to, I want to embed this. I want to put this on my other page. I need to figure out what that user experience pattern is, where the heck that would go. I need to probably find not the link that I would expect, which is right in front of me in my browser bar, but buried under share and embed. I need to know what the heck HTML is in order to put this there. Maybe I want to get rid of these suggested videos or I forget to add privacy mode, whatever the thing is, right? There's a lot of options and choice involved here for something as silly as I want this stupid web page to show up in another web page. So if I copy and paste this link here, hit configure, hacks figured out, oh, that looks like YouTube. I have a tag that'll, that'll play YouTube and created this little form for it in a holding pattern so I can see as a user get a preview of it and say, I want it to be a responsive video instead of a whole ton of CSS that no one understands. Quite frankly, I don't even understand the CSS to make a responsive video. Um, we can implement it once and now users have the choice of whether things are responsive. Um, this is a caption for my own video. Okay, so I can write some text here, two-way data binding, I can reflect it there in real time. Because it's components leveraging components, there's a component out there that does this awesome color picker. So now I didn't make the color picker, I just implemented the color picker, two-way data binding the color picker to another input value. I hit insert, and now I have that in the page. It figured out how to handle that link. It figured out how to put it here, figured out that I can position it and scale it and change some of the responsive options and things. If I wanted to duplicate it, I can just hit duplicate. Now what I'm actually doing there, if I hit export, is Hacks is actually just writing HTML. So it's doing all the things that an advanced dev developer could do. In this case, leveraging a video hyphen player tag. Scale it up a little bit. Uh, leveraging a video hyphen player tag 
And then whenever you edit things like checking the response bu responsive button, it's just going into the responsive property and saying, yeah, you're true now. Um, if I wanted to download this as a standalone file that didn't need hacks anymore, I could do that. And so now this is everything that I just made and changed, except it's a local file running on my computer. And this isn't, you know, this is neat. This is like my, has been my life recently. Um, but it's not actually dependent upon anything that we're making for it. So we're, we're making all of these elements, um, but Hacks is completely pluggable. Hacks knows that, oh, that is a meme. Why? Because I know it's a meme tag, but we made a, a meme, where is it? It's a meme maker. And so we made a meme maker tag. And a meme maker tag is a silly tag so that you can, you know, put a, tight, a heading on the top and bottom. And then I could change those have them data binded, reflected, and update. Now I've got that updated there. Um, but we've, we've moved from just adding stuff into like finding things. Like, so if I don't wanna go to YouTube or I don't wanna go to Jiffy or anywhere else, I don't wanna go to my asset management system for my institution, that I could just find things in one cohesive dashboard. Um, if that's searching YouTube, that I could search YouTube from here jump to the next step, automatically skim off of their API. And so this is all, you're just components on components on components on components on components on components, on components um, to the point that now, and this I'll be demonstrating it at a DrupalCon in two weeks now, but um, we've now wired hacks into multiple content management systems to illustrate um, just how absurd this is. So that system I just showed that was static, we have wired into uh, Drupal 6, which if, if you don't know, Drupal 6 has been deprecated for a long time. But now I'm making a rich authoring solution for Drupal 6, except I'm not. I'm not making it for anything. I'm making it for the web. It happens to be really easy to integrate into Drupal 6. And it'll look and function the same exact way as if it was in Backdrop CMS, which is a fork uh, of Drupal in this case, as if it was in Grav CMS, as if it was in uh, Elm's Learning Network has a, a slightly different integration point of it. Um, but just the idea that I can make web components which work anywhere on the web, so any of the tags that we've been, been building, you know, that I showed, even that BYU one, or not BYU, the Utah Rocks one, I could put that in scope up here. The browser would know what that tag is when I import the reference to it. But then we could wire it up to a solution like Hacks pretty easily, like within a minute or two, uh, so that we could say, hey, that, um, you know, I want, I want uh, to search Wikipedia. Okay, well, let's make a component that searches Wikipedia. And then, well, Hacks can provide the authoring system. So that there would be no more integrate Wikipedia with fill in the blank system, or there would be no integrate MathJax with fill in the blank system, that we just have those things and that the tags would be able to express to something like, like Hacks, hey, this is how you edit me and this is how you get HTML back out of me. And then we ship that off to save into an HTML you know, based system. In this case, I hit save and now it's saved. So um, this is a rather ridiculous technology uh, concept, just the web components in general. Um, so I, I I'm, would highly recommend doing things in web components over any other framework. We have done things in, in Vue and React and Angular. Uh, we actually built an app in Angular, and that was that was the last time we'll, we'll ever do that again. Um, um, and this just beats the pants off of of those approaches from from what we've seen. So, with that, I don't want to, you know, it's it's Friday, it's past an hour. I mean, I'm I'm available for another hour if you guys want to ask questions or see anything. I'd be happy to show whatever. But um, yeah, do you have any any questions? Any questions? Uh, so the question is, what kind of grid system for CSS do you use? Do, okay, so I'll ask a question, answer a question with a question then. Um, do you mean, do I use personally or do you have to use to do things this way? I guess can you do that. <laughs> um, so, we are not using any grid system currently um, by design. We're not adhering to any one specific grid 
Um, and it's because we're working on a tag called responsive grid, because why wouldn't we be? Um, so we've kind of started to say, well, anything can be a tag, then let's just make everything a tag. So our, uh, one of our UX people uh, who works with me, uh, Nikki made this, this tag. And now if I want things to be responsive, instead of defining you know, different class names, right? Instead of like S2, L4 type of, of stuff. Um, instead, we have these tags. And so we say, well, this is going to be a row. And then I want a column. And at these different breakpoints, I want you to be these different sizes. Um, so we're going to data bind this to hacks, which probably in the next month or so, uh, so that you could actually use hacks to put this tag down into the interface and to place things in it. Um, so we historically were using um, uh, Zurb Foundation, and then we switched to Materialize CSS. Um, you can that you can still use these other systems. Um, the way at which you use a grid system, or you know, non basically, you have to account for non-scope CSS. So this is a an area of conflict a lot of developers have with the Shadow DOM concept. Is to go okay, I can style encapsulate, but for something like a grid, that's pervasive. I need that to be everywhere or else it's not gonna know what the heck to do there. So there's two ways, two ways you can accomplish this. One is, um, this is slightly specific to Polymer. Um, I can tell Polymer, even though Shadow DOM exists, I want you to treat the page like Shady DOM. And Shady DOM is, it's, it's still actually there. You can get to it. And so it scopes it well, but you can actually write an aggressive CSS selector to hit it. Um, the other way is in, uh, oh geez, let me find one of, our, one of our elements that uses it, probably in one of our layouts. Um, there we go, okay. Um, you can import style sheets uh, just like you could before. So in this case, I have an element that supplies colors. It's literally just a whole spectrum of, of color named classes. That could be grid stuff as well. Um, and then I can include that. So now inside this dialogue, where you know, if you made a tag that was like the body of the page of whatever you're gonna make, and then you add all your, your um, selectors in there, um, sorry, your grid, grid classes in there, you could still apply that that way. That's answering your question, Dan. Yeah. Any other questions for Brian? Well, Brian, um, I think there's no other questions. Um, again, thanks for taking the time. This was great. Um, appreciate it. Um, and maybe next time I'm in Penn State or you're down here, go grab, grab a beer or something. Um, <laughs> You have beer there? What? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Okay, um, have a great weekend, and thanks again for doing this. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.